Hello and welcome to the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. Each episode will bring you the latest news from the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, as well as fascinating interviews with entertainment personalities, government leaders, and community advocates. St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, where Scotland meets the City of Angels. Let's get started. Hello and welcome to the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles' podcast. I'm your host, Joanna, and today we've got an amazing show lined up for you today. But first, I would love to introduce our guest moderator, Steve Tom. Steve is a television, film, and commercial actor and trustee for the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles. He is best remembered for being the human spokesman for Geico Insurance in 2018. Also, some of his television and film work includes Parkinson and Recreation, NCIS Los Angeles, Major Crimes, one of my favorite shows, Dumb and Dumber 2, Too Big to Fail, and Ghost Light. Unfortunately, after 38 years of running the rat race, Steve recently moved to a cozy mountain home high in the Colorado Rockies. We miss you so much out here. Where he keeps an ample supply of space side single malt whiskey to help him navigate through the strange times that we're living in. Steve, thanks so much for being the moderator for today's episode. Thank you, Joanna, uh, and welcome to another in a continuing series of podcasts from the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, celebrating Scottish culture and traditions in all of their incredible varieties. Now, tell me something. When you hear the word mystery, what do you think of? A locked box? A dimly lit staircase? Perhaps an old pocket watch? Well, as a child, our guest today absolutely reveled in mystery. His innate fascination with the enigmatic and unexplainable guided him to the craft of illusion at a very, very young age and created in him a sense of wonder that he knew he had to share with the rest of the world. He began studying hypnosis in Milan at the age of 15. By the time he was 19, he had gained very important recognition from master illusionist David Blaine. And by the time he was 21, he was headlining at one of the UK's most prestigious theaters. There is no doubt that his passion is sharing the experience of true and elegant mystery and making our jaws drop while he does it. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome magician, mentalist, and illusionist, Mr. Scott Sylvan to the podcast. Scott, thank you so much for joining us from uh, uh, Glasgow, Scotland, I understand. Indeed. What an incredible accent, Steve. It is great to be here. Thank you so much for such a wonderful introduction as well. And hello to you as well, Joanna. Hi, I'm very excited about this show. It's so Me nice too. To now, Scott, you're only 28 years old. Is that right? Well, actually, I'm 39, unbelievably. Oh, Isn't that terrible? 30. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Someone, someone will, someone's head will roll for that. I'm just going to hang up now, Steve, if that's okay. It was great <laughs> to meet you both. Goodbye. <laughs> 30, 30 years old, and you've already had uh, 12, 13, 14, 15 years of experience on the international stage. Uh, including a smash off Broadway show and uh, performing at some of the most prestigious and and large international arts festivals in the world, and even uh, a command performance for royalty. And despite the drudgery, the intense drudgery of all that, you're still more energized and inspired than ever and planning some amazing audience experiences. Yeah, for television and in international theaters for all of us, once that we can all safely gather together again. Uh, but in the meantime, this is the most important thing. And, and the reason you're here today is uh, to talk about The Journey. This is your new show. It's, a, it's an all virtual show. And it will be um, making its debut in Los Angeles uh, at the Broad Stage on October 20th for a two week run until November 1st. And I really strongly urge everyone who hasn't called the Broad to get your tickets 
to please do so. It's going to be an amazing experience, and I'm excited to talk about that and lots of other things uh, during our time today, Scott. That's wonderful, Steve. Yes, I'm really excited to share about that experience with you. It's been a strange time to create some new work, but um, I, I feel that I, I carved out a, a unique show that no one else is really doing, where I invite 30 people from across the world to travel virtually to my home here in Scotland. And we go on an adventure that explores the power of home and connection and place in our lives. And we use the audience's imaginations and memories as the guide on the journey. I'm so excited about starting it in LA soon. I'm interested in learning more about the specifics of the show, but I, I, how has the, this awful global pandemic affected you? I mean, it, it seems that you have had to have made some pretty drastic changes in the way that you uh, bring your work to audiences, right? Very much so. So I was in the middle of a world tour um, when the pandemic hit. Uh, and I had just finished in Sydney. Uh, I had went to Seattle and I, I sort of got trapped in Seattle for a few weeks. I, I was one of three people staying in a hotel there. And I realized, okay, this is going to last a little bit longer than expected. So I, I headed back to Scotland for what I assumed would be a couple of weeks just to see some family. And uh, five months later, I'm still here. So pretty much within the first few weeks of coming back, I realized that the tour that I was on was probably not going to be able to continue. And I started to think about the profundity of coming back home being forced to come back home to um, a place that you've not visited for some time and a place that had such a formative experience for you and had inspired so much of my work and thought, I have to create something that speaks to these times. So fairly quickly, I was able to pivot into, into this new medium. And then over the past three or four months, I've brought my team together to create this new show, The Journey. Mm. Let's go back to the very, very beginning, how mm. all this started. Now, I understand that your uh, grandfather, piqued your interest in magic and illusion when you were but a wee one. How did all of that happen? Yeah, very much so. Now, incredibly, he wasn't a magician. Um, I think he just learned a few simple tricks in his army days when, when he was a young man. And I remember I was four or five, and he, he made me sign my name in a little piece of candy with a Sharpie, and he vanished it. And then he pointed to a matchbox that was on the table, covered in lots and lots of uh, elastic bands. And he took all these elastic bands off the little matchbox. And inside was my signed piece of candy. And I was absolutely hooped from, from that age. He told me the secret, and it was deeply disappointing. But I, I realized <laughs> that, that there was something incredibly interesting in taking these um, very normal um real day-to-day -day life things and creating the impossible from them. And he taught me some card tricks and some very simple vanishes. And from that point, that was really my guide uh, into the world of magic. And so he was really yeah, the catalyst that, that made it happen. And I think he was shocked himself that it's it's lasted uh, this long. And I, I've made a career out of it so far. Mm. Being from Scotland, uh, must make your fascination with storytelling and mystery so natural because Scotland mm. is certainly uh, well known for being shrouded in the mists of mystery and magic and storytelling. Uh, how has your Scottish heritage contributed to your craft over the years? Well, yeah, you're absolutely right, Steve. It's a place where myth and mystery is just woven into the fabric of its identity. And we are a nation of storytellers. So I, I remember as a kid hearing all these incredible myths about uh, the Selkies and fairies and the myths that happened in the Scottish Hebrides and Skye. And visiting these places as a kid and living really close to nature really piqued my interest in the wonder in the world at that age. So just being surrounded by that sense of mystery in nature was my North Star in many ways to, to ex explore magic. Um, so looking back now, I realize just how much of an influence it, it's, it's had on, on the illusions that I've created going forward. You mentioned a couple of areas there, the, the Hebrides and the areas mm -hmm. in the north. Are there, are there particular areas of Scotland that you've always been drawn to, either personally yeah. or performer? 
Yeah, very much so. So I, I'm from the west of Scotland. So I, I grew up uh, just outside Glasgow and then I, I studied in Edinburgh, which of course is a city that is just shrouded in mystery and magic and light and shadow. Um, so that that's where I did my theatre degree and I stayed there for many years. But I remember taking day trips and weekend trips as a kid to the Outer Hebrides and going to places uh, like Skye and Colonsay and St Kilda and these, these tiny remote Scottish islands that seem to hold so many secrets within them. And it was just such a huge inspiration, that, that sense of limitless exploration at that age as well. I think we live in a time now where everything is so easily explained and so easily uh, searched for on the internet. But when you search for the history of some of these Scottish islands, some of these places, they are still shrouded in a sense of mysticism. And I find that quite fascinating and powerful. I've always felt exactly the same thing when I've been, mm. been, been back in Scotland, and I can't wait to go again. Sadly, we Americans aren't allowed in at the moment. I know. I'm not allowed out as well. <laughs> okay. Hopefully that'll change soon. Um, I want to talk about um, creating your art for just mm. a moment. When you are... Uh, brainstorming an idea for an illusion or in the process of uh, creating what you need to create to mm. put something together in, a, in a, the most compelling way you can, how long does that take? How many hours go into your preparation process? Mm. It is a very, very process um, because very often the, the catalyst uh, of an idea, for me, it, it comes from starting from the end and saying, okay, this is an impossible thing, but this is what I would like to achieve. And then working backwards and finding a logical way to make that impossible thing happen. So sometimes you're using techniques that you have uh, trained in, that you have in your arsenal, whether that's a storytelling technique or a psychological technique or a traditional magic technique, and it easily slots into creating that impossibility. And it might be a couple of days. Other times, I, I have ideas in my head that I've had for years that I, I know this is something I would like to do someday, but I just don't have quite have the solution for it yet. So it, it varies dramatically um, depending on the effect, but my constant is very much starting from the end of the process and then working backwards from there. You just mentioned believing in the impossible. Mm. Do you find that your audiences or and people in general have some innate need to be able to believe in something that they know is impossible and yet they've just seen it with their own eyes? Yeah, I think I think we all have that desire. I think as we get older, we we lose that sense of childlike wonder as things become more easily explainable and we become um more and more insular in our, our beliefs as well. And I think the, the power of magic and, and mentalism in general is what I do is so personal to an audience and that they're, they're being asked to share their emotions and memories and bring that to the experience. And then we're creating these impossible experiences from them. So not only is it reminding them of important moments from their past, but it's also allowing them to look at that experience in a different way and perhaps seeing it anew for the first time. So I often speak about that idea of reawakening wonder, um, you know, much as we, we had as a kid where you saw something really powerful and wonderful for the first time. We all have that within us. I think we do all have a desire uh, to believe in something, something greater than ourselves. So that's the hope. I love it. Joanna, jump in. I, d I have two questions for you. Technology and storytelling and traditional magic. Mm. How does that all interplay? Because you just you just were talking about that right now, and it just kind of popped in my head with technology being the way that it is. How does how does that transition from doing something like when people think of magic, they really do think of tradition and mm. something that's old and and old timey. But now, especially even with your new show coming in, how is mm. technology kind of moving you along um, as an indigenous? Yeah, I think people often think that technology is a is a hindrance to magic um, because everything is, once again, easily searchable and you can go onto YouTube and maybe find some terrible secrets of magic as well. But 
what many people don't realize is that the technology has always been at the forefront of magic. It was a magician who invented cinema, who created the moving image um, on a screen. So magicians have always been searching for the most advanced uh, technology to interact with as well. Um, there's a quote, I think, is it by Arthur C. Clarke, where he says, any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. And with, with that show, with the show that I'm creating, that's really what I wanted to be my guide on it. Um, I'd seen lots of shows that have existed in this realm so far that are um, sort of Zoom-based shows where audiences are in little boxes and there's a degree of interaction. And I, I think those shows are really interesting and special. But I wanted to see how far I could push the technology um, in this experience. And as I say, not use it as a hindrance. So my big thing was, how do I connect with an audience in the most effortless way possible? How do I make that technology seem invisible? So what we've created is, is a custom piece of technology where the audience um, log into a portal for the experience. And then all that happens is they sit back and watch. You don't have to mute or unmute your mic. You don't have to uh, make the screen bigger or smaller. And whenever I want you to appear in the room with me, you will appear in a floating box in the room beside me, almost like a hologram, which is very exciting. And then when we have all the audience together in the space, we actually project the audience into the space with me. So the audience are on the walls behind me throughout. So to me, it feels like the, the closest form of a uh, live theater possible. We've also um, used technology in the advanced content in the audience experience where we send them some advanced films um, of, of my childhood in Scotland they, they interact with. But we've also created a, a binaural sound experience that the audience will listen to before they come to the show. And it gives this sort of surround sound sense that you're standing on a beach on a tiny island in Scotland. Because in many ways you are, because we filmed it there with, with incredible technology. And um, you have me as your guide leading you on this path, thinking about a memory from your past. So it's, it's really exciting to take technology that I thought I would never use within my work and, and find a way to, to weave it through um, the magic experience. That sounds amazing. And I'm like a little kid right now. I'm like, oh, I want to see this. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to have you there. It'll be fun. I'm excited. I am a huge fan of magic and I've never wanted to know how tricks how any of it happens, in, mm. not in a way that I wanted to look it up, but in that way that I want to know how they did it immediately. It's like, oh, how did they do that? And <laughs> I don't want to know because I, I don't want that to be taken away from me because there, there's oh. this moment where all of a sudden you you do have this wonder and a funny story. Well, and, 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 and mm. like, like David, when his grandfather showed him how the trick was done, I don't ever want to feel that uh, that is that all there is feeling. Yeah, you know? exactly. I ask you how that's done, and I don't want to know at the same <laughs> time. <laughs> it's it's true, and I, I actually wish there was more people like you, Joanna, who are, are willing to give themselves to the experience and appreciate that. Everything I try and do in my shows, it's not about me trying to fool you or convince you that magic is real. It's about us going on this journey together for one moment in time and allowing yourself to see the extraordinary. It's almost that like we're standing on the edge of a precipice and you have, you're just seeing the edge of something impossible. And then we pull you back from that precipice in the end and you come back to reality. And that, that's always my guide for it. it it's not convincing people that, um, magic actually exists it's um, in the world of, yeah. of uh, television and film and i'm, I'm sure mm -hmm. you you're familiar with this term um we want our audiences to be able to suspend their disbelief mm -hmm. we don't want to have to convince them of anything just naturally suspend that disbelief and i think you're talking about the same thing absolutely absolutely and often i try and get to that point where you hopefully create a, an illusion uh, that is powerful enough that it actually breaks through that willing suspension and suddenly you just give yourself to the experience. So it, it, everything I try to do in most of my shows, it sort of builds in terms of impossibility that it, it, it gently leads the audience into the experience thinking, okay, well, I can sort of work out how that would be done and maybe that's how this would be done. And the more you go on, the more impossible it becomes as more and more audience members get involved in the experience. 
Um, and really what I do as well is it's not about me standing on stage saying, look at these wonderful things that I'm doing. It's about us as a collective group achieving the impossible together. So it allows the audience to relax a little bit into the experience that it's not about trying to work out what Scott's doing on stage. If you're enacting it yourself, if you're providing your own thoughts and memories to that experience, um, it allows that sense of wonder to take hold, hopefully. Awesome. So without giving away any secrets, what has been your most difficult illusion that you've ever had to perform or develop and what, what happened? Mm. It's it's actually an illusion in in this current show, The Journey. Um, it involves six people in the illusion, and if any one of the six people don't quite work out as I would like it to work out, it's like a house of cards, and the entire illusion comes crumbling down. Um, and it's it's a multi layered um, impossibility where it, it builds in, in terms of stages. If one of those stages doesn't work the entire thing collapses. Um, so every night it's, it's a little uh, <laughs> exciting and nerve wracking to do it. And also I, I gave myself a challenge where you can build a rapport with people when you're in the same room uh, with them and you get a sense of who someone is and how they might react to something. And, and so much of my work is, is based in that psychological sense of rapport where uh, in this experience, because it's virtual, it, it's so much more challenging that you don't have a chance to speak to the audience beforehand. Uh, you're not hearing the audience for, for the most part, and you're just picking six people randomly to take part in this this one moment of the show that, that builds towards the finale. And it involves um, audiences' memories. It involves um, them making a series of decisions. They all have to make the exact same decision as they go along. Um, and then it involves something from someone's childhood that I couldn't possibly know um, as, as the kicker at the end. So it's it sounds very complicated, and that's because it is. It's sort of like many parts coming together. Uh, and I just uh, yeah, presented it for the first time last week. We, we just opened last week. Um, and so far, touch wood, it, it, it's working out okay. But every night I, I take a deep breath before that illusion begins because I, I know if, if, if one element of it doesn't work, I have to explain why 15 minutes of the show hasn't, well, that, <laughs> hasn't that, came together. I, yeah. I, I know there has to be a plan B in Indeed. case the House of Cards comes down. Of course, absolutely. And uh, especially with mentalism, um, unlike traditional magic, uh, if you're doing a card trick, it's very much about a technical skill that you were repeating again and again and again. And there's a real beauty in that, um, much like a pianist is playing the same composition again and again. But with mentalism, it changes every single night that you do the show because the illusions are entirely based on what the audience themselves are thinking. So there's no way that you can plan for that in advance. Uh, so there is many roads that the show can go down. And if you come to the show multiple times, you will see the many paths that, uh, the illusions take as well, which is, um, maybe why you should buy tickets for, uh, for multiple shows as well. See what happens <laughs> each time. Mm -hmm. But, <laughs> but, uh, I, I've been doing it long enough now that, I certainly wouldn't put anything into the show that I, I wasn't confident that I, I knew the audience uh, wouldn't connect with. Uh, and it, I would say it's about a 95% um, chance of working every time, but, it, but it's that 5% that makes it, um, makes it exciting. And that's, that's what's so interesting. Lot. Yeah, very much so. And uh, that's what I just love about doing the, the show as well and, and all of my work. Um, you know, I just finished a, a tour last year and we, we did about 500 shows over, over the course of the year. And I speak to friends and they say, oh, you know, how do you keep up the, st the stamina and the sense of engagement and sense of presence in a show like that? But every night, it's such a cliche, but it, every night it really feels completely fresh, like you're doing the show for the first time because you, you are sitting down with a group of people that you've never met before. And it, it's then giving themselves to the experience because it is so interactive uh, and immersive. I know that you and I share one, probably two things in common. And that mm. is a, a deep love of both food and uh, 
in in my own case, uh, Speyside single malt Scotch whiskey. Bravo! Oh. Oh. Excellent. <laughs> And you, uh, you're inter in in the journey. I think specifically, you've interwoven those two things into the performance. Can you talk a little about about that? Absolutely. So um, we we don't actually inter inter weave whiskey into the journey. Um, it's my my previous show before that called Illusionist Table that we interweave whiskey into it. If we interwove whiskey into the journey, it would, it would make the experience all the more challenging as everyone sits at home getting drunk and whiskey and I try and <laughs> keep track of the performance. But that's an interesting idea, Steve, that I maybe I will add to future shows. <laughs> but yeah, it's um, the show I've been touring previously is called At the Illusionist Table. And as you see, it interweaves food and whiskey, and it's an entirely sensory experience for the audience. Um, and the catalyst for that idea came from when I was living in Edinburgh, and I was a, a poor student. I wanted to create a show. And I used to walk by uh, Queen Street, which is just behind Princess Street in Edinburgh, or, or, or part of the new time. And there's this beautiful Georgian building there called the Scotch Malt Whiskey Society. And much like the St. Andrew Society, it's got this wonderful storied history where it collects some of the rarest single malt whiskeys in the world from distillers, bottles them up, and no labels on the bottles. And you become a member of the society and you share in these exquisite whiskeys together. So that was my catalyst. Then I thought, wow, I'd love to do a show in a space like that. And I'd love to do a show that involves whiskey because everything I do is about, is about the senses and how they can be manipulated. So I, I approached them for the, for the Edinburgh Festival, um, which is it's the world's biggest arts festival that is in Edinburgh in Scotland. And, and half a million people descend upon the city uh, in August of the year and experienced 3,000 shows that take place in the city. So that was my sort of first professional engagement was, was creating the, the show at the Illusionist Table, which involved whiskey. And it was really the thing that kickstarted my career that I met my, my first manager there and then moved to London and then moved to New York. And the, the show really took me all over the world just because I, I had this idea of connecting a show with whiskey. So I, I've got a lot to thank for it. But the, the beauty of, of that experience um, initially was the society would provide a bottle of whiskey. It would often be a Speyside or an Isley whiskey, 20, 30, 40 years old. And there would be one bottle for each performance. So we would share that bottle around the table and then that bottle would never exist again. It was, it was a once uh, in a lifetime experience, which it had such a beautiful transience to it hopefully like the magic I do that you're witnessing it in that moment and experiencing it. And then it just fades away and all you're left with is, is the memory of it. So when I've been touring the show in the States, we've, we've had some, some great sponsors. We've had Clint Livid and McAllen and Albany whiskey. Um, and on the Isley side, we've worked with Lagavellen and Lafroig, which I'm sure you, you know, all of those, um, those beautiful whiskeys as well. Well, what's your favorite space side? What do, what do you enjoy drinking most? Uh, a whiskey that doesn't get as much attention as a lot of the mm -hmm. others. I happen to mm -hmm. love it. It's called, it's called uh, the, the brand is called Bowmore. Oh, yes. And there is a 10-year-old Bowmore that is mm -hmm. so incredibly smooth and peaty. And I'm a, I'm a peat guy. Mm. Um, and, and if it doesn't taste like a bonfire burning in your mouth, mm. then I, no thank you. Uh, uh, but uh, ten-year-old uh, Bowmore, um, and I can't. Great and, and the varietal has a specific name which I can't recall at the moment. Mm. That's my favorite. We 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 used a Bowmore and um, at the Illusionist table. There's there's a sequence in the show where we lead the audience on a visualization where everyone does a, a whiskey tasting with me. That is an incredibly peaty and oaky whiskey, mm. and then everyone closes their eyes and and we go in this journey of the mind where they, they go into a forest and they see a bonfire and they see a, a memory appearing in the bonfire. And um, when we did the show in, in New York, we, we had a really beautiful setup where we would fill the room with oak smoke as the, as the show was happening. So when everyone opens their eyes, they're surrounded in the in sort of oaky bonfire smell as they enjoy mm. the whiskey. Really mm. special, really special. Mm. Mm. That sounds wonderful. <laughs> <laughs> there have uh, there have been some notable illusionists and magicians and mentalists in the last mm. 
I don't know, 100 years or so. Houdini, Harry Houdini, of course, Penn and Teller, mm -hmm. David Blaine, David Copperfield, Doug Henning. Um, is there anyone in particular that has, that you've identified with and, and, and mm -hmm. has had inordinately large impact on what you do? Mm. There's, a, there's a couple of people. Um, one, I, I remember a, as a kid watching Copperfield on TV, as, a, as I'm sure we all do. And what really connected me with Copperfield was it wasn't just about the tricks. It was about the, the story and the journey that he would take the audience on. It was so much more exciting than just the, the person going in the box. And then in the UK, there was a, a mentalist uh, called David Burglass, um, who... Uh, right, right now he's not too well known, but he he had a um, huge TV series here in the UK, and I remember watching his shows late at night, where he would just lead audiences on on a journey of the mind, just doing these incredibly impossible things. Um, so those are the two people I really connected with uh, when I was younger, and then looking at the the storied history of magic, if you go go back to the Victorian era and the vaudeville era. There was some amazing mentalists there, uh, Alexander, who billed himself as the man who knows. And he just went on stage and read people's minds. And he, he had sort of incredible techniques that he would use, some dubious techniques, where he would you know, turn up to a, a town a few days in advance, and he would go into the local pub and, and pay someone off uh, to hear the secrets of the local town and what people had been speaking about. And then miraculously, he would tell the, <laughs> tell the secrets of the town on stage. I'm not <laughs> sure that I would, I would have liked to have <laughs> attended those performances because I'm not sure I want anyone to know. But. <laughs> so when you hear some of these amazing stories of, 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 of these guys that, that, that did some of the work, it, it's pretty special. But to be honest, Steve, um, for better or worse, I really didn't take too much inspiration from magic when I was growing up. I, I had the initial bug of magic from my granddad, but then when I was you know, 12 or 13, I, I moved into mentalism and the more psychological side of magic. And then my main inspiration from there has, has been film and theater and art and um, using those as, as, as the guide for, for creating my shows. So I, I obviously really admire the work that... Um, David Blaine is doing right now where he, you know, he's really moved into uh, these incredible stunts that he does where he, he puts the body and mind to the, to the extreme, hugely inspirational stuff that he does. Uh, the English mentalist, Darren Brown, is, is a bit of huge inspiration for me as well, as well as so many mentalists. Um, and yeah, Copperfield and, and David Verglas um, are probably the four. Mm. Mm. How would you... How would you describe yourself in, in the context of what you do? I, you've used the term mentalist today mm. with us, magician, illusionist. Are you primarily one of those things? Are you an amalgam of all of mm. those things? Uh, it, it, because it, it, I've, I've seen some of your work on, on, online, and mm. it's been difficult for me while watching to categorize you and put you in a specific box? Mm. That's a really good question, actually. And I often think about that myself. That um, When you think of the categories of a magician and an illusion, illusionist and a mentalist, what does that really mean? You know, what's the difference between an illusionist and a magician? A mentalist is, for me, it, it, what I do is I create theater of the mind. So I, I create impossible experiences using people's memories and emotions rather than what a magician would use where they might use props and more day-to-day um, -day items to create magical experiences from. But I've never been too concerned with the, with the differentiation um, of it. My, my focus is always just in creating an impossible experience that inspires and engages an audience. And whether that's through storytelling or whether it's through mentalism or whether it's through the, the psychological or hypnotic techniques I use, um, it doesn't really matter to me too much. It's just about taking, yeah, taking the audience in that experience of the impossible. But if you had to categorize, I, I suppose you would say a mentalist or, or a delusionist. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. A Scotsman, now, whatever you like. Now, you didn't just all of a sudden appear on the scene. Um, you know, 
stories of you know the starving artist or mm. legion out there and uh uh but i've never heard of a starving magician or a starving illusionist you mm. i'm sure you've struggled in your life with this choice of profession that you've made and then nothing came very easily to you i'm guessing mm. While you're about to hear about a starving magician, Steve, this is the first one you've met. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, there was two things that were very lucky to me. I, I moved to Edinburgh to, to study there, um, to do my degree there. And serendipitously, as I mentioned, that, that's where the Edinburgh uh, Fringe, the, the Fringe Festival started 70, 80 years ago world's biggest arts festival. And, and looking back now, I realize how lucky I was to have that experience on my doorstep because it just really opened the doors to every sort of international producer and, and agent who comes to the Edinburgh Festival to, to seek out new work. So I studied in Edinburgh, lived there for a few years. I really held myself back from doing shows just for the money. So very often when you think of a magician, you think of someone that does your bar mitzvah or your wedding or uh, something like that. And those are really lovely things and wonderful experiences to have. But I really wanted to create something that was more personal, more a piece of theater um, and something that spoke of my own experiences in life. So that's what The Fringe was so wonderful for that Every year I would prepare for August, I would develop a new show for the festival. You throw all of the money that you've saved up that year into doing the show at the festival, and you, you hope that some people come and see it. And I did the festival for about four or five years, um, and then that, that's when I, I took the leap to, to move to London, and, and things really started to, to move from there, where I, I began performing in theaters there. But it really wasn't until I was probably 26, um, that um, I signed with my manager in New York and things started moving really quickly from there where three weeks later I was doing off-Broadway in New York and we ran that show for nine months and then I went on a world tour. Um, it, it's often the thing that when you think about it, it seems as if all of this has happened so quickly, but it's it's really been since the age of 12 or 13 that you, you find yourself chipping away at something and, and deciding what it is that you want to do and who you want to be. And, what you want to say to the world. And I, I still think I'm discovering that right now as well with, with each show that I play. But no, starving right. no more, you'd be pleased to hear. I can have some whiskey uh, in which is good. Thank goodness. An overnight <laughs> is rarely overnight, that's for sure. What indeed, about your parents? Um, your parents, uh, always supportive or um, did one or the other do mind the rules? No, go the, get the uh, real job. I know. Well, amazingly, they actually were very supportive and none of them were involved in the arts um, or had any particular interest in the arts for that matter as well. And I think um, my granddad definitely helped by them seeing how much I engaged with that and how much I enjoyed it. And then ha having a hobby from that young age as well, I think was pretty special. I think they definitely thought that by the time I turned 15 or 16, I would decide when I go to college that I was going to train to be a lawyer or something like that. Um, yeah, I think that's what they were they were initially hoping for. Um, and it didn't happen. Studied theater. And then luckily, I just sort of kept myself ticking along where I, I kind of had full time work. And before they know it, um, I am where I am now. So I really I really have then to thank for just being yeah, so supportive uh, of the work and especially my grandparents as well, sticking by me and never really forcing me to to do something that I didn't want to do. Because yeah, I, I was one of the first in my family to go to college as well. So, um, and it was to study theater, which <laughs> uh, was, a, yeah, I know, <laughs> uh, was challenging at the time for them, but um, it's worked yeah, quite okay. that, yeah. Oh my goodness, I bet, I bet. <laughs> Your work looks so effortless, so incredibly effortless. What thrills you and continues to thrill you about illusionists and magicians and mentalists and magic in mm. general? I think it's, it's the fact that it allows you just for a moment in time to look at the world in a different way, to look at yourself in a different way. And, 
realize that you are capable of so much more in life if, if you choose to be aware of it. And I've often heard that magic, uh, an illusion, is dying. Every year you hear that it's, well, this is it. This is, you know, people won't want to believe in that anymore. But we all have a desire to connect with something um, so much more powerful than ourselves. And I think magic is such an easy door to that. Um, it just allows you to see wonder in the world. And it's been so inspiring for me, often knowing the secrets of it, that I hope it has the same level of inspiration for, for each of my audiences. And secondly, it's about seeing the wonderful connection that comes uh, from from my shows where you are taking a group of disparate strangers who do not know each other. And by the end of the evening, they have connected in hopefully such a profound way that it's an experience that will stay with them for a long time. I find that endlessly inspiring. What about dry spills? Does, does the well run dry from time to time or are you continuously uh, having new ideas flowing mm. and demanding to be explored all the time. I definitely, um, of course, as I'm sure we all do as creatives, have some dark hours where you think, this is it, I'll never have another idea again. <laughs> <laughs> and then 20 minutes later, something comes. Um, I think what's helped me is, is always been open to where inspiration comes from. Uh, as I said, like very rarely it has came from other magicians or watching other magicians as much as I enjoy engaging with other people's work. It's, it's not where I get my source of energy or inspiration from. It's usually from visiting a gallery or watching a film or uh, seeing a piece of music. And that suddenly is the, is the catalyst that, that kicks off something new. In the case of the journey, it was it was being forced to return back to Scotland and thinking, oh goodness, I, I just had to cancel 600 shows uh, that I'm never going to get back. And then realizing, wow, what an incredible opportunity to invite an audience into my home and it, it experience what inspired me and what inspires them. So I think it's having that sense of openness, that sense of engagement with the world and... Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully those dry spells don't come too often. Joanna, anything you'd like to to uh, to add before we reluctantly say goodbye to? I was, I was just thinking, I'm like, we maybe have time for one more question. Of course, of course. I think we might have to wrap this up. <laughs> <laughs> Even though I don't want it to end because I'm having a blast. Um, but yeah. it's been said that your performances bonds people to you to the experience, even to those around them, some sort of like Jedi mind trick, Star Wars. <laughs> Got it in. What of your own personality um, gets you that reaction from people in your audience? And why is that such a bonding experience mm. to those? And they talk about, I mean, audience members talk about it among each other as well, but mm. they feel that bond with each other. And yeah, how, yeah, how does that happen? Yeah. I think it's uh, the, the way that I design the experiences is, is that it's, it's, as I say, it's never about me standing up front and saying, look at these impossible things that I'm doing. Please try and work it out. It's about us engaging in that experience together. And unlike traditional magic, where a magician can sit and do a card trick and he only needs one person in an audience to be looking at him and doesn't really need any real engagement. He can still manipulate the cards. Mentalism and the type of stuff that I do requires the audience to fully give themselves to the experience. There's such a big part of it. So I think having that level of engagement from the start, the audience knowing that this is a singular experience that entirely relies on their thoughts, memories, and emotions. And the fact that I am there purely as a guide, as a conduit to the experience and not as some master magician helps them engage with it fully and realize that all we want from this experience is, is connection for, for one moment in time. It's been lovely to see. Um, it, it, it's always been my hope that, that that's what audiences take, take from my shows. And it, it seems to be a theme of my shows now is that it's audiences coming together and bonding for one moment in time. And I often hear years later of audiences that have, have met at one of my shows and became friends and stayed in contact. And 
hold on to the mementos from that show as well and then yeah, bring them to, to shows they see in the future. It's, it's so wonderful to me to hear about. So that's, that's as close to a Jedi mind trick as, as it gets. It's just the, the power of connection, unfortunately, Joanna. <laughs> well, yeah, to, I'm, I think it's a simple case of, of uh, the, the larger an audience's own investment in mm. the process, the greater the reward. Indeed. That's so true, Steve. Oh, very much so. Scott, you have been a delightful interview. I, I, thank you for, uh, I'm, I'm so glad that we were able to get our schedules together and that you were able to free yourself up to do this because I know you have a lot on your plate coming up. Uh, I can't wait to see you perform in person. Uh, all of us feel the same way. Uh, but until that's possible, we are looking so forward in Los Angeles to seeing you in your virtual show, The Journey, at the Broad Theater, the Broad Stage, uh, starting on October 20th and winding up a mere two weeks later on November 1st. So get your tickets now if there are tickets available. I'm hoping there are. I'm going to try to finagle one somewhere. And uh, stay safe, Scott. Uh, Scott uh, Sylvan, thank you very, very much for being our guest uh, today. We, uh, we're very appreciative. And uh, Slan Shabbat. Cheers. Well, thank you so much to both of you. It's been a real pleasure and such an engaging time. And I hope we all get to share a whiskey somewhere sometime soon in person. Okay. I hope it happens. Hi there. A pleasure. Take care to both of you. And thank you again for uh, uh, tuning in to another St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. We'll look forward to seeing you next time. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles podcast. For more information on the St. Andrews Society of Los Angeles, visit www.standrewsla.org. And don't forget to like our Facebook page, Instagram, and YouTube channels as well. Have a great week and we'll see you next episode.